أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فقال الله تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي My dear brothers and sisters as we are passing the middle of Ramadan we only have a few more days left and subhanallah this Ramadan uh, the the most unique Ramadan in our entire lives and probably maybe there will never be one like this again before again but half of it is already gone and it feels like it passed in a few days and this is the reality of every good thing that good things they they end fast you know they don't last forever and this is the reality of this dunya that every good thing everything that makes us happy will only last for a little bit however ramadan is one of those things where the prophet sallallahu said that towards the end of times you know, when the jal will come, the, 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 the sense of time will change. And also that uh, the time will pass quickly. And this is something that we experience that Ramadan, as if it passed, you know, subhanAllah, I cannot believe that today is that is, we are in the middle. You know, I was looking at the moon and I was like, subhanAllah, it is, you know, the full moon, which means that now it only has to go down from here until it will be no more and Ramadan will be gone. However, as the Prophet ﷺ said that in, our, in the month of Ramadan, our goal is to come out of Ramadan having been forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having been freed from hellfire, having shown Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that he should have mercy on us. And for that, alhamdulillah, we still have enough time. For that, we still have enough time. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O son of Adam, as long as you invoke me and ask of me, I shall forgive you for what you have done, and I shall not mind. Wala ubari. That as long as we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us, as long as we call upon him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us what we have done. Now, to put more emphasis on this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says O son of Adam were your sins to reach the clouds of the sky and you then asked forgiveness of me I would forgive you if we were if we had so much sins that if our sins were piled up they would reach the clouds Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says then you ask me for forgiveness I will still forgive you and then he says O son of Adam were you to come to me with sins nearly as great as the earth and were you then to face me, ascribing no partner to me, I would bring you forgiveness nearly as great as it is too, as, as great as your sins. SubhanAllah, what a merciful Lord. And this is uh, an, a Hassan hadith uh, collected by a Tirmidhi. And it is, in the, it is the last hadith in the hadith of the, the 40 hadith of Imam al Nawawi collection. My dear brothers and sisters, today I want to remind myself 
first and foremost on all of us about the importance of Toba and the fact that the time for Toba is now, the time for repentance is now, to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to beg for his forgiveness is now. And subhanAllah, a person might say that, you know what, I just made Toba like last week. I just made Toba last night. Why do I need to make it again? The fact is that with regards to Toba, we need to con continuously keep making this, this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep asking him because we don't know which one will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the sooner we do it, the better it is. The sooner that we do it, the better it is because we don't know when our time will come and our door will close. And that's something that we will talk about later on, which is what are the conditions of Tawbah. Now, Tawbah refers to, Tawbah refers to, uh, is simply put in simple language, Tawbah means a U-turn. A person who's going away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then they stop and they turn around and they now start to go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of their lifestyle, in terms of their deeds, in terms of their ikhlas. And we need to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if we feel, which we shouldn't feel, that we don't have any sins or we don't have too many sins. I have more good deeds than I have sins, so I don't need to really worry about tawbah. No. This thought itself is something which can destroy a person. This thought itself is something that can destroy a person. You know, it is said that shaitan's greatest achievement, shaitan's greatest achievement is not to uh, make us commit sins. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet wasallam, already told us that every son of Adam is a sinner. So shaitan doesn't really achieve much if he makes us if he convinces us, if he whispers to us, and we commit a sin. His greatest achievement is to make us feel, make us convinced that I am such a sinner that Allah will not forgive me. And subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ told us what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that don't worry about how many sins you have. Don't worry about what kind of sins you have. If your sins reach all the way up to the clouds, if your sins covered the entire earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I will still forgive you if he asks me for forgiveness. So my dear brothers and sisters, what I want to remind myself, first and foremost and all of us, is that sins are not the ending, but sins can actually be the beginning of something beautiful. That a person realizing how they have disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, you know, in so many ways that they have disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they get the proper understanding, the proper knowledge, which is just little that is required, then they can actually use that sin as a catapult, as a catalyst to actually change their life around. And there are so many stories for this. You know, there's a beautiful book that I have in front of me. It is called Stories of Repentance. Stories of Repentance. And this book basically is a story of people, stories of people that made tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I will share with you one of these inshallah. But my dear brothers and sisters, there are so many ahadith about tawbah. Number one, the Prophet sallallahu said that I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness 70 times a day. In another hadith, uh, more, than, uh, more than 70 times a day. So sometimes, and in one hadith, a hundred times a day, and in once more than 70 times a day, that the Prophet ﷺ, between 70 and a hundred times, literally speaking, he was asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him every day. And the simplest way that we can do that is we can, what the Prophet ﷺ used to say, Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. I ask Allah to forgive me, and I turn back to him. I ask Allah to forgive me and I turn back to him. Inshallah, I'll share with you the author of the book later. The Prophet ﷺ, he, to he told us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not care about how many sins we have, but when we come to him sincerely for forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us. Now, the scholars of Islam have studied all the evidences about tawbah about the acceptance of tawbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا التَّوْبَةُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ وَلَيْسَتِ التَّوْبَةُ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ 
and uh, the other ayat in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that tawbah is not for those people who continue to commit sins and they're saying that when the time comes, I will make tawbah. When I'm about to die, I will make tawbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ظَلَمُوا uh, that uh, ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ uh, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ That those people who when they commit something inappropriate or oppress themselves, they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the forgiveness of their sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these are the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. These are the people that are muttaqeen. These are the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, inna Allah yuhibbu tawabina wa yuhibbu al-mutatahireen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who continuously make tawbah. So one of the ways in which we can earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by continuously making tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and constantly purifying ourselves, loving to make wudu, loving to make ghusl. And I always advise everyone, you know, first and foremost myself, that whenever you uh, go out, when you take a shower, like, you know, many people, they'll take a shower before they go to work, if they go to work these days, right? Or when they wake up in the morning or before they go to bed, they take a shower. Every time you take a shower, don't just take a shower, but make intention that this is ghusl, the ritual impurity, even if you don't need to get it. And you make sure that you fulfill the fara'id of the ghusl or the, the arkan of the ghusl, which is to make sure that every single inch of your body, every single hair in your body becomes wet. And nothing even you know, in your scalp deep down under the hair is left dry. If you do that entirely, according to some of the scholars, your ghusl is complete. Some of the scholars, they also add the mouth and the nose. The mouth and the nose and other scholars say that no, this is, this is recommended, it's not required. But they say that mouth, because we open the mouth and air goes in, dirt goes in. So the mouth is kind of like an exterior surface of our body. So it has to be washed. The same with the nose, that it is, you know, air and dust goes in there. So it's kind of like this area is uh, this interacting with the outside world. That's why it needs to be washed and clean as well. However, the other scholars say that this is a recommendation because the Prophet ﷺ said that when a person makes uh, this uh, cleaning of the nose, when you put water up your nose, then let him do that, you know, deeply as much as deep as he can as deep as he can because except for the one who's fasting except for the one who's fasting because when a person basically sucks up water in their nose the water actually might end up in their throat and they're not able to it's not easy to get it out it may just go in so a person who's fasting the same thing goes with gargling the mouth that when a person gargles, they should actually take it down in their throat if they can, and they should gargle it so that anything that's there will get out. And subhanAllah, this is now uh, turning out to be one of the uh, miracles of the Prophet wasallam that this entire coronavirus thing, you know, the testing is done right here. The testing is done right here. Of course, I'm not saying that, you know, if you just make... Uh, 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 whistle and gargling the mouth and nose and stuff like that, it will uh, pr protect you from that. However, we can see the importance of cleaning this area. We can see the importance of cleaning this area. So the scholars have said that there are certain conditions that we learn from the evidences that show us what the conditions of toba are, the conditions of toba are. So they say that number one is that a person must be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his or her heart. Meaning that if a person is pretending to be Muslim or a person is not really, you know, unfortunately we have this so much now in every religion, including Islam, that there are people who are born in a family that is Muslim or a Christian or a Jew or any other religion. And they don't really care about that religion very much. They don't know anything about that religion. They just do what their family does. So whenever, you know, there is a time of wedding, so they'll call the imam. When someone dies, they'll call the imam. When a baby is born, they'll call the imam. Uh, when Ramadan begins, you know, they will make sure they, they miss everything, but they will make sure that they don't miss iftar. Uh, but, you know, it's just to 
they are doing what everyone else is doing. But deep down, they may not really have a true connection to Islam. They may not have a true connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we come across people like that from other religions all the time. But they say that I'm becoming Muslim because although I was born in a Christian family, I didn't really practice Christianity. I went to church, you know, with my family, but I didn't really care about it. I didn't understand it. There are Muslims like that too. And that's why for parents who have children, it is important for you to make sure that you connect their heart to Islam. You connect their heart to Islam. Teach them in it. Teach them Islam. Why we do this? You know, whatever you can find out. Not there's for for every why there is no answer. For for many whys there is an answer, and those answers are sufficient to help us reach the satisfaction that if you know ninety six of my whys have an answer, my questions have an answer. Four of them have not been answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't give us this knowledge. But the, the amount that have been answered, they give me the satisfaction that I'm following the right thing. So this is a responsibility on the parents. And for the parents to ask those questions that their kids come up with to others if they don't know the answer. You know, my son was telling me uh, that he wants to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He saw a video of these kids, of a kid's video of prophet stories where they have a person who's the prophet and they don't show anything except like a white figure that's walking around and talking to people. They don't show his face. They don't show his body. So he said, is this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I said, no, this is not Allah. So he said, I want to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a difficult question. And I'm trying, I'm coming up, I'm thinking about the answer of how I can explain to him that we cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, just preliminary, I'm thinking about, you know, ex showing him that, look, you see how the sun we cannot see, it's there, it's helping us, it's giving us sunlight, it's giving us heat, but we cannot really look at the sun because our eyes are not capable of looking at such a strong light. In the same way, there are, there are other things like angels that Allah has created and he has told us that you don't have the ability to look at them. So to save us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has basically turned that off for us. If we looked at it, we would lose our eyesight. If we looked at an angel, we might even completely die. In the same way, we have not been created to be able to look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life. We will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a different life, in the day of judgment, and in Jannah, inshallah. But if a person doesn't answer questions like this, then at some times when kids grow up, especially when they become teenagers, then they might start to think that, you know, my parents cannot give me an answer because they don't, there is no answer for this question. And then they start, shaitan is then whispering in their mind. And then that small little question becomes a huge doubt. And, you know, you will see online, that there are these ex-Muslims who are now basically going out and they're talking bad about Islam and they're saying that Islam is not based on any you know, logic, logical sense or rational, rationale because a lot of these kids, they're coming from a household where their parents didn't have uh, good answers for them. But of course, we cannot paint everyone with the same brush. There are times when the parents do the best thing that they can, best job that they can, but Hidayah is in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah to protect all of our children, to protect all of our brothers and sisters, to keep them firm upon Islam. So number one condition of tawbah is a person must be sincere to Allah in his heart, that they're really asking Allah for forgiveness. And they really believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's number one. Number two is that a person, a person should genuinely regret his past sins. So if a person was, for example, involved in gambling and now they're making tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they should truly, sincerely regret and dislike what they did in the past. I understand that it could still be tempting, right? That a person says, you know, a person who is addicted to alcohol may say, you know, alcohol, I can't stay away from alcohol, but yeah, Allah, I feel bad for what I've done. This feeling of feeling bad must be a genuine feeling in their heart and not just lip service. And that is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. 
as opposed to a person who, for example, he's saying, oh, Allah, forgive me. And in the meanwhile, he's thinking, you know what, maybe next weekend I'm going to hit up the slots again. So this is not a person who genuinely does not regret his past sins. Then this is a condition, a violated condition that they do not really fulfill the conditions of their proper tova. Number three is that a person should sincerely intend not to do it again in the future. And of course, we all know that we are human beings and no matter how much we pledge to Allah that I will not disobey you anymore, we may still fall into it again. That's okay. The future is in the hand of Allah. But right now, at this moment, I must sincerely be pledging to Allah, Ya Allah, I hate what I did. I hate that I disobeyed you. I, I hate myself for that. However, Ya Allah, I pledge not to do it again. I'm going to try whatever is in my power. I'm going to try to stay away from it. Forgive me for that. And if a person in this sincere dialogue with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or monologue with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, him talking and Allah listening, if a person sheds a tear only in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then of course that adds that much, that much more sincerity in it. And the Prophet ﷺ said that when a person sheds a tear for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in front of Allah, alone with him, uh, regretting his past sins, asking him for forgiveness, that teardrop does not dry or it does not drop on the ground except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives him before that. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ told us that from the people who will be granted the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of resurrection are, will be the people who remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala privately and their eyes filled up with tears. Number four is that if that person is still doing that sin, then he needs to stop it. He needs to stop it right away. So for example, if a person is, um, you know, if a person is living a lie of some type, if a person is, for example, uh, lying and they got some type of uh, benefit from that, you know, they're, you know, let's say a person uses a fake identity. You know, I, you know, I know people who basically they made their money from at a time when identity uh, theft was much easier. And they basically used to open up fake credit cards and they used to get lot thousands of dollars from that. And they're still living in houses and they're enjoying and they have, you know, the, maybe the phone that they're using to read Quran was bought from that. And the chair that they're sitting on, that they, uh, that they are, you know, making, reading Quran was bought from that. So those type of things, a person has to cut as much of that as they can out of their life. They need to get rid of those things. If they can't give it back to the person that they stole it from, if there is such a person, many times there isn't, then they need to you know, liquidate that and they need to give that money in charity, not expecting a reward, but expecting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lesser their sin because they now got rid of the benefit that they got from that sin. If a person is lying, you know, of, you know some of the people I read that uh, they, um, they wanted to get in an Islamic university and this Islamic university required a high school diploma because it was university level. And some of these people, they wanted to go there and study Islam so bad that they falsified a high school diploma which they did not actually have. And then they got in that university based on that false diploma. But when they realized and they regretted what they did, so some of them, they actually went to the university office and they said that, you know what, you know, we realize what we have done is something really bad. And we realize that getting kicked out of the university is not worse than being punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what we have done. Basically, we are living a lie. So they went and they confessed. And they said, look, this is a situation. We don't have a real high school diploma. Now, I don't know. I, I know it's a cliffhanger, but I don't know uh, what happened to them if the university left them or not. But a lot of these were American students in a Middle Eastern country. And, you know, a lot of times they, they do make concessions for Western students, new Muslims and things like that. But, but if a person is still doing that sin or still, still living that sin, then they need to stop that. 
if a person is, for example, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for being abusive towards their family members, they can't be asking Allah for forgiveness and still be abusing them. If they're using someone else's uh, illegitimately taken money, they need to stop that. They need to give it back. They need to stop using it. If they can give it back, they need to give it back. If they cannot give it back, they need to give it away. Get rid of that. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees their sincerity in asking for forgiveness. Number five is that if the sin was against a person, then that person needs to try to fulfill the right that they violated or make up for what was lost. If a person stole from someone and they're now asking Allah for forgiveness, then if they can, they need to return what they stole. If they cannot return what they stole, then they need to maybe buy them something new and give them as a gift. If they, you know, sometimes a person might be in a situation where, you know, it's, it would, the harm of that would be too great. So in this case, they need to basically then get something else like that. And then they need to give them as a gift or send it to them. And, you know, there are different ways of doing whatever. If a person, if there's a will, there's a way. If not, sometimes a person may just find the right moment and go up to them and say, you know what, I have to apologize to you for what I have done. And I am in front of you, you know, whatever punishment you want to give me, I'm ready to take. It is mentioned in a famous story that a man, he was passing by a garden and he ate a, an apple from the tree. And when he, he was very hungry and when he had already eaten half the apple, he realized that he did not ask permission of the owner of this garden. So he looked around and he found a house in that big field and he went to that house and he knocked on the door. And he said, when the man opened, he said that I'm here to ask you for your forgiveness and to ask you if you wish to punish me or if you want to take some of my belongings because I ate half an apple from your garden. Here's the other half, but I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. So the man said, I will forgive you on one condition. He said, what's the condition? He said, I forgive you on the condition that you have to marry my daughter because I'm not going to find a man as sincere as you in this world any other than you. I'm not sure. So if a sin was against a person, then he should try to fulfill the right or make up for what was lost. And number six is that a person must make that tawbah and ask Allah for forgiveness before it is too late, before it is too late. And that is the time of death for a person when the soul is leaving the body. And we, we see from many a hadith that for us, looking at a person who's dying, we might just see a person who is going to stop breathing in a, in a minute. But that person actually sees angels coming to them. They see the angel of death coming to them and sitting by them. And they might even say a few words and we might just think that they're rumbling, but they're actually talking to the angel. The angel might be saying something to them. So it must be done before that time arrives, when the veil from the eyes are lifted. Or it must be done before the sun rises from the west, before the sun rises from the west, which is the Prophet ﷺ told us that when the sun rises from the west, the door of Tawbah will be closed. The door of Tawbah will be closed. Now, one thing I want to share with everyone, and I know that we are uh, towards the end of our time, um, It is something that is written by Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah. And he said that more than one person has said to me, when I repent to Allah and perform righteous actions, my sustenance is strained and difficulty comes upon my livelihood. And subhanAllah, I read this and I have myself experienced this, which is that when you're doing the right thing, sometimes you feel that a difficulty comes upon you. You make tawbah to Allah, you're asking for forgiveness, you stay away from sin, and then a difficulty comes upon you. And there are times in my life when I wasn't doing what I should have been doing. And I felt that my life was good. So Ibn Qayyim, he wrote this, he said that more than one person has said to me, and I can be included in that one person. However, when I return to disobeying, this is what he says, when I return to disobeying him and give my soul its desires, then sustenance and relief and other than it comes to me. What a strange thing. So Ibn Qayyim says, so I replied to some of them that this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see whether you're truthful or untruthful in seeking refuge with him and responding and submitting to him in obedience 
and exercising patience upon what he has commanded. So this is a test from Allah to see, are you sincerely asking him for forgiveness? Are you sincerely repenting to him seriously? Or are you just doing the motions like everyone else is doing? This is a test from Allah. So that, uh, so he says, so if you are patient in that difficulty, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he will make it known. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it known who are the sincere ones, who are the truthful ones, and who are the liars. So when a person makes that tawbah, turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, difficulty comes upon them. Do not think that this is, uh, this is a punishment, but this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet said, Allah tests those whom he loves. He doesn't test those whom he doesn't love. Those people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the purpose of a test is to actually bring out the good in you. For the other people, that same calamity will be a punishment. And it will actually push them away. But for a believer, it is a test which actually brings him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It brings him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lastly, I will share with you the story of Toba from a man. Um, and I know that there are kids watching, so it's, um, I will try to you know, keep it. Some details I will keep. A righteous man was once asked to tell a story of when he changed. You know, a lot of us, uh, a lot of us, it is a time, uh, we have a time where we were a different person and then we changed. So he said, when I was a young man, I would not hesitate to perpetrate any sin that was made available to me. Then one day I saw a young woman who was perhaps the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. And he wanted to enjoy her company. And he basically uh, offered her money to come and spend time with him. And this woman, she came to him, but she was, she was shaking and she was so afraid and she was so uncomfortable. And he said that I said to her, do not fear, I will not harm you. But he said that my words did not lessen her fright, her fear, but it actually made it even worse. And she began to tremble like a palm tree leaf trembles with the wind. And I said, tell me what's going on. What, you know, why are you doing this? I'm giving you money. So she said, by Allah, oh my brother, never before this day have I, have I ever done this, what I'm doing today. Dire need is what has driven me to this. For I have three daughters who have not eaten a single morsel of food for three days now. It was feeling bad for them that brought me to this low point in my life that I am here taking your money for this. Something then happened to me. So the man said that something happened to me that has never happened to me before. I felt sorry for another human being. He said, I never felt that before. Today, I felt that sorry. After she told me where she lived, I took a great deal of money, clothing and food to her house. When I returned to my house, I told my mother what had happened. My mother, so his mother knew that he used to basically have a journal where he used to write stuff like this that he used to do. So she said to him, my son, you are a man who has never performed a good deed, except that the good deed that you perform today. So, and you write everything that you do in your book. So go and write this in your, good, in your book as well. So he said that when he went to his book and he opened it, all of his previous exploits had been erased. It was just blank. And there was just one line that was written. And that was, Inna al-hasanati yudhibna sayyat. Verily the good deeds remove the evil deeds. Verily the good deeds remove the evil deeds. He said at that very moment, I raised my hands to the sky. And I said, by your might and majesty, bi'izzatika wa jalalik, never again will I disobey you, ya Allah. Never again will I disobey you, ya Allah. So subhanAllah, the last point that I wanted to mention is that one of the things that we can do is to, to follow up our sins with good deeds. Follow up our sins with good deeds. So let us 
follow up whatever we have done by number one, making tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then fueling our spiritual uh, relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with Quran, with salah, with dhikr, with dua, studying the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and learning his story. And of course, if you're following our daily series, we are covering the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam every day, which comes at iftar time, around, around 7.30. And that of his companions, learning the stories of the life of the companions and training oneself to abide by good character. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us our tawbah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq to come out of this Ramadan having been purified by him and having been forgiven by him. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from among those people who will be the companions of the Prophet وسلم, on the resurrection. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not prevent us from being among the people who will see him on that day. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our affairs easy for us and fulfill the need of all of those people who are going through difficulty. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal all of those who are sick. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal all of those who are sick. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all those who have passed away. And those who have passed away in this pandemic, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept them as shuhada for his, to sincerely for him who are in Jannah, inshallah. Uh, now, uh, before we finish this video, I want to remind everyone that we have an important program coming up this Sunday at 1 p.m. I know that uh, we have about 40 people that are joining us. Uh, through Zoom, and we have um, about 40 people that are joining us on YouTube. So all of you, inshallah, please make sure that you join us again at 1 p.m. on Sunday. Inshallah, we will send out the link for you uh, to join us. This is a program, and we have a little video that I'm going to share with you um, right now so you can get all the information about this program and what this program is. Just stay with us for a few minutes and then inshallah we will end our program today. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ وَلِتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ وَلِتُكْمِلُوا Allah has blessed us this month of Ramadan, although this year our Ramadan is very different from all previous years. May Allah keep us healthy to complete this month of Ramadan with khushu and sincerity. We at the Islamic Society of Augusta would like to invite you and your families for a special event. We are hosting a virtual fundraiser on Sunday, May 10th at 1 p.m. Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid will be joining through Zoom for this special event along with our own Imam Jawad Rasul. Sheikh Karim has also sent good wishes and a brief message for Augusta Muslim community. My dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Imam uh, Kareem Abu Zaid, a uh, familiar face uh, to your community, the Islamic uh, Center of Augusta. Uh, and brothers and sisters in Islam, uh, this is uh, my invitation to all of you to join me kindly to help your community, to help your community. We are going through 
unprecedented uh, case here. Never happened before uh, that we can't be together the night of the 27th to raise the necessary funds in order to support our community. Uh, but we want our work to continue in spite of. That's the attitude of believers, regardless, brothers and sisters in Islam. Mark your calendars. May 10th, May 10th, 1 o'clock p.m., I will be joining you on Zoom to encourage you, brothers and sisters in Islam, to support your community. And remember, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Ramadan used to be more generous than ever, based on Hadith Abdullah ibn Abbas of Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet used to be more generous than ever. And his generosity would increase in Ramadan because of the Quran. Let's join hands, inshallah, May 10th at 1 o'clock through a Zoom uh, broadcast. Uh, the brothers uh, in the community will notify you of how to join the conversation, inshallah. And let's raise the necessary funds needed for our community in Augusta. I love you all for the sake of Allah. And I'm still looking forward to seeing you. I was actually planned to see you before Ramadan. But qaddar Allahu wa ma sha'a fa'al. Jazakum Allah khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to invite you all to a very special program that's going to be taking place on the 10th of May at 1 p.m. on Zoom, in which Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid is going to be joining us live. So I really hope that uh, we can all get together to support our beautiful masjid and all the beautiful programs that we do here. Our masjid is one of the most active masajid in America, and I have traveled uh, you know, many states, many cities, and I have uh, done programs in masajid all across America, and I have not seen a masjid which is as active as ours. There are very uh, a few handful of masajid in America that are as active, that have as many programs going on simultaneously as our masjid here in Augusta for a very small community. This is a huge accomplishment, and I hope that uh, we can uh, convince everyone to understand how important it is to continue to support these beautiful programs. I hope to see you all in our special program on 10th of May at 1 p.m. with Sheikh Karim Abu Zayd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. This is Sohail Khan from the Islamic Society of Augusta. Please mark your calendars for Sunday, May 10th at 1 p.m for a special program featuring guest speaker Kareem Abu Zaid. The link to the program will be provided on the website and in the newsletter. Once again, this program is on Sunday, May 10th at 1 p.m. The link will be in the website and the newsletter. I hope to see you all there. Inshallah, Ramadan Mubarak. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Jazakumullah khair for everyone to stay with us. Um, host, can you unmute everyone if anyone?